we are going over the Part B-2 questions from the June 2022 Chemistry Regents exam. These are short answer questions, so these would be ones you would answer in a booklet. Um, what else do I want to tell you about these? There's 15 questions for Part B-2, which are your, again, your fill-in type questions, and then you'll have 20 questions with Part C. Let's start here with 51. All right, so there are three questions associated with the isotopes lithium-6 and 7. And it's very important that I point out to you this solid line ac uh, across here underneath question 53. So in other words, these three questions are associated with this data. A lot of times students will make a mistake and think they don't have enough information and they forget to maybe look at the little reading passage or the data table itself. Anyway, let's get started. So for 51, we have to state the number of electrons in an atom of lithium-7. The 6 and the 7 you see are different isotopes for lithium. And if you remember, isotopes means same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Now, your protons are not going to change if it's lithium. The number is going to be the same. And if it's an atom, atoms are electrically neutral, protons will equal electrons. So we need the number of protons. It's not here. You need to go to the periodic table and look at the atomic number for lithium. And let's do that. All right, we're at the reference tables, periodic table. We're looking for lithium. And there it is all the way here on the left. It is element three. So you are talking about three protons. And since it's an atom, that's three electrons. That's your answer. All right, in 52, compare the energy of an electron in the first shell of lithium to the energy of an electron in the second shell of the same atom. Well, lithium's electron configuration from the periodic table, there are two electrons in the first shell closest to the nucleus and then one electron. It turns out that the first shell electrons have less energy than the second shell. So it always goes less energy to more energy as you move away from the nucleus of an atom. So you could say first shell is less than second shell, second shell has higher energy than the first cell, shell, excuse me, something like that to get the answer correct. All right, and then finally for 53, showing a numerical setup for calculating the atomic mass of the element lithium. You are gonna see an atomic mass question, I don't care if it's multiple choice or here in B2 or part C, somewhere when you take your regions exam, it always comes up. Now, it turns out that the masses on the periodic table are known as the weighted average of the naturally occurring isotopes. So in this case, lithium has two isotopes, uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7, and you'll notice that one has a, definitely a lower percentage than the other. So with our setup here, okay, what we want to do is we're going to use the atomic mass and we're going to multiply it by the natural abundance. Um, then you we're going to add them and then divide by 100. That's one way. Your teacher might have shown you another way. In other words, all we're going to do is I take the 6.0125, since they gave us the atomic masses out three decimal places, use those. That's going to be times 7.59. And for the other one, I'm going to just put it on this side because I'm going to run out of room. And that is 7.016 times the 92.41. So we're multiplying, we're adding them together, and then draw yourself a line, and we're going to divide by 100. So in other words, what one of my colleagues calls this, he calls this getting mad. Multiply, add, and divide. All you have to do is show the numerical setup. You're not calculating the answer. Put this in the booklet, and you are done and moving on to 54. All right. It's 54, 55, and 56 that are associated with the graph. Let me go ahead and scroll up a little bit so that you can see it. We're dealing with the atomic radius here on the y-axis and the elements in period 3 going across on the x-axis. And in 54, it says 
state the general trend for the atomic radius of the first seven elements of period three when considered in order from left to right. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're going from left to right. And yes, we can see that the atomic radius decreases. Fairly easy, straightforward. Let's go to 55. 55, it says, state in terms of valence electrons, why aluminum and sulfur have different chemical properties. This is a little bit of a twist from the typical regions question. Let's go to the periodic table and I'll show you why. Okay, so we're looking at um, aluminum and we're looking at sulfur. These are in two different columns. The, and remember though, you can't just say, hey, one's in group 13 and one's in group 16. It said in terms of, anytime you see that with a part B-2 question or part C, you better make sure you have those words, whatever they are, in this case, valence electrons in your answer. Aluminum being part of group 13 has three valence electrons, and sulfur in group 16 has six valence electrons. So when it comes to chemical properties, they're going to be totally different because they have two different numbers of valence electrons. Now, I said this is a twist because usually the regions uh, type of question here would ask you where properties of elements being similar, and then you would be looking in the same group or column. This time, they switched it out, but very easy. Aluminum, three valence electrons, and sulfur has six valence electrons. All right, then, and for question 56, it says identify the element in period three, and here are all those elements, right, where you're going to have an ionic compound with the formula X2O, right? So we have to identify what the X is. Now, Let's go to the periodic table. I want to show you something here. All right, something to always keep in mind, that compounds are what we call electrically neutral. In other words, their overall charge is going to be neutral. They're not going to be overall positive or overall negative. And if I have a format of X2O, the reason why I need two atoms of X, whatever that is, of course, in period three of the periodic table is because oxygen needs two electrons. It has six valence. It's trying to get to the magic number of eight valence electrons, which is stable. So if oxygen needs to gain two, and I have two X atoms that are going to give up electrons, right? Metal, non-metal, ionic bonding. What we're talking about here in group three is going to be sodium. That's our answer. And you could have written the uh, symbol NA or the name. All right, moving on to 57 and 58 here. Once again, we have a little bit of information about lithium, beryllium, boron, and fluorine. They're all part of period two, which is period, remember, is a row on the periodic table. And in 57, state in terms of electrons, why the radius of beryllium two plus ion is smaller than the radius of a beryllium atom. Well, let's go to the periodic table. All right, so you can see that beryllium as an atom is atomic number four. That means four protons and four electrons. If it's a beryllium two plus ion, it's lost two electrons. And of course, as a result of losing electrons, it is smaller. That's your answer. Okay, and then the next question is asking for the Lewis dot diagram for boron. So while we're at the periodic table, here is boron. A Lewis dot diagram means we're going to write the symbol to represent the nucleus and any inner electrons, and then the dots represent valence electrons only. Those are the electrons that are found furthest away from the nucleus. Boron's electron configuration is 2-3, and so that means we're talking about three electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and put three dots around the boron symbol. Now with my students, I tell them the first two dots are paired. Oop, I don't know what happened. Hold on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the first two, to, two on here. They represent the two um, valence electrons 
that are paired and then one other dot. As long as you have three dots around boron, you're going to be fine. You'll get the credit. Okay, so let's take a look at 59 and 60 here. We have a reaction between 2-butene and hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst, and we end up with one compound they have represented with the letter X. 59 explain in terms of molecular formulas and structural formulas why one butene is an isomer of two butene. Well, the, the one and the two just tell us where the carbon-carbon double bond starts. That's the only difference. In other words, the molecular formulas are going to be exactly the same, but the structural formulas are different because 2-butene has the carbon-carbon double bond starting on the second carbon, and 1-butene would have it starting on the first carbon. You don't even have to get that fancy. Again, molecular formulas are the same. Structural formulas are different. Done. For 60, it says draw the structural formula for the missing product X. Well, you only end up with one product. You have an addition reaction here. That's, that's all you can have. And right where I have the circle, we're going to have a break in the double bond. So we're going to end up with a carbon-carbon chain now with no double bonds. And these two hydrogens are going to go ahead and park themselves where the double bonds were. So we're just going to fill up now, make sure every carbon always has four bonds with hydrogens. And you don't have to draw the, the H symbols around as long as you have the dashes representing the bonds. All right, let's keep going. All right, so here are the last five questions in this section. And you'll notice that they've kind of clumped things by topic. Here we're dealing with acids, bases, and salts. And we have some information here about a titration. For 61, state the number of significant figures used to express the volume of HCl solution. All right, so we find the volume. The volume was 24.0 milliliters. When I'm going to count significant figures, and I have a number greater than one with a decimal, count them all. So the total number of significant figures for 24.0 is 3. For 62, identify the negative ion for sodium hydroxide used in the titration. Well, of course, you have an ionic bond here between the sodium and the hydroxide, right? The sodium was plus, the hydroxide was minus. It's the hydroxide ion, or OH minus, would be your answer. For 63, what about the number of moles of hydronium ions to the number of moles of hydroxide ions? Hydronium ions, just to make sure that you understand, is literally an H plus with H2O, right? So hydrogen ions, an excess is an acid. Hydronium ion, it's really the same thing as hydrogen ions. It's just that we've stuck it on the water molecule and ended up with H3O plus. So when I have a titration and we're exactly neutralizing, our moles of hydronium ions are going to be equal to our moles of hydroxide ions. That's what we mean by neutralize. And that's all you have to say. 64, you're asked to complete the equation for the neutralization. I'm just going to write it here. You have an acid, that's HCl. You have a base, NaOH. And then you're given two lines for your two products. This is a double replacement reaction. All right, so there's going to be a switch here. And all we're doing is literally just swapping out like any other double replacement reaction. What do we end up with? We end up with H2O, right? HOH is H2O and NaCl. So an acid plus a base forms a salt and water. And then finally in 65, we got to determine the molarity of HCl based on the titration data. Let me erase all this other stuff first. Now we want to figure out molarity of HCl. Let's go to reference table T. Let me find the right equation and show you why one equation would be the right equation and the other isn't, and we'll come back and figure this out. Okay, so we're at reference table T. I'm scrolling down. Maybe I'm scrolling down. I had this problem before. Oh, 
Hold on. All right, now I scroll down. And as far as molarity goes, you're going to see molarity here. Moles over liters of solution, moles of solute over liters of solution, and then molarity here. The molarity of an acid times the volume of the acid is equal to the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. So you have two different places for molarity. You don't have the moles of solute when we go back and take a look at the information. We might have some volume, but we don't have the moles of solute. It's not going to work. We need the titration equation. And we were dealing with titration type questions. A lot of times students, they'll try to fit something in an equation that doesn't fit. We need the MAVA is equal to MBVB. All right, so I wrote out the equation. We're determining the molarity, so you're actually going to solve for it. We're going to just put things where they belong. The molarity of the acid, that's our X or MA. That's what we're solving for. The volume of the acid was given as 24.0 milliliters. So I'm going to just throw in the 24. On the other side, the molarity of the base, 0.18 molar. And the volume of the base was 16 milliliters. As long as your volumes are consistent on both sides, either milliliters on both or liters on bo both, you're good to go. So you're going to take 0.18, multiply by 16, divide by 24, and your answer is 0.12 molar for the acid. And that ends B-2. And check out other videos. Make sure you also check out the other parts of this Regents exam. Practicing questions is a great way to get yourself ready, both the multiple choice and then the fill-in answers just like this. Good luck.